I suggest that we make four themes this afternoon. Question one is one, and question two is one, and then question three and four deal with reuse. But I think we combine that together, and the last one probably also that we can look at pharmaceuticals and pesticide in the water at the same uh, way, probably first discussion together and then uh, in detail. First, I would like to start with the first question, and I think that's clear. I would like to give the floor now to George Konstantin, the water director of Romania, to give his view on the first question. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Good afternoon, because it's my first uh, um, word here. I want, first of all, to thank the European Commission for the blueprint and to say something that we are with the we are in, with the implementation of the water framework directive much far than without this directive concerning the water protection. The image you presented, in my opinion, it was a grey image. For Romania, it's a light grey than uh, dark grey. In a way that uh, the EU directive helped us to advance with the water protection. Secondly, related to this question, I think that it's a fundamental issue which we have discussed in the morning. Relation between water quality protection and the money, which is an important issue, you know. If you look now on the television, you will see only news about the money, you cannot see news about the water. But I think that the water is so important that uh, we have to, to give the proper attention. Without money you are poor, without water you are dead. But, <laughs> but in order to protect the water, you need the money. I was wondering why you choose me. our target. We are not reaching our target. Only 45% will not reach in. Yes, maybe it's true probably, but in 2000, when the directive has been uh, um, enacted, if you put it the question, where will be the European Union in 2012, I don't know how many would give the answer. However, despite this uh, um, difficult financial situation, we are committed to go forward with the protection of the water resources because it will be essential for our country and for us as a living being. We also need money, I consider, for promoting uh, innovation. You know, when you have to uh, promote this infrastructure will be very expensive to build, but also expensive to maintain and operate. And if you give me a Mercedes or a Rolls Royce, I will say thank you not, I cannot pay the fuel uh, for this. Therefore, probably I will need another car which will allow me, I, I enjoy to have a Mercedes, but it's too expensive for me. This is what I think that the innovation should provide us with the solutions which will be um, possible to be um, supported in the way of operation and maintenance. 
Also, I think that, as I said, not all the funds should come from the EU, even if we are respecting also an important part from the EU. But this, a lot of funds should come from the private sectors, which will have to work uh, for the improvement of uh, their infrastructure or of their practices, I'm referring here to agriculture and to industry. In order to do this, it was highlighted already that the, we need to strengthen the economic mechanism. And I can tell you that this is a key, issues, a key issue. And we had the experience uh, in Romania with this economic mechanism. In 2000, we increased the price of the drinking water three times. The result was that uh, the consumption per capita decreased from 540 liters per inhabitant a day to 120 in 10 years. Also, it was an increase. This is a happy example. It was an increase in the fertilizer price. The use of the fertilizer in agriculture decreased tremendously. I said that this uh, economic mechanism in the water field will be very important because it's very efficient. And I, I, I want to tell you that uh, we consider very important to have a European approach. In Romania, all the users are paying for water, with one exception, navigation on the river, which is only the Danube, the most used. The idea is that if we will not have a common approach in the, at the European level, we will fail with this uh, initiative. Right now, we have increased, for example, for, for hydropower, the price of water used for hydropower three times. Now the government of Romania is in court with the hydropower industry because they are complaining about this increase. But I think they are using, they are the most uh, important user of water. The last issue which I said also it's important for the, for, uh, to pro be provided uh, with uh, financial resources is related to integration in the other policies. This is a very, very important issue. And uh, here it's an, an issue related, as it was highlighted uh, in the morning, is the issue of the subsidies, which will create a lot of problems. And uh, if this will not be tackled at the EU level, it will be very difficult to do it at the national level. And just want to remind you that I have read that the European uh, Parliament say, said no to a moratorium on the shell gaze, which and this issue will be left or has been left at the national level. Will be a very, very big problem to tackle at the national level, at least in some countries. <laughs> And then I will not say that we need more EU enforcement, but I think that we need more EU support, particularly from the European Commission. And uh, this support is necessary for uh, steering the process of the implementation of these uh, directives to continue the implementation of this directive at the European level. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Georgi, for this overall view. Uh, may I ask and to add with and then Niels? Okay, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. So indeed, I'm representing CIFIC and a, a large number of companies. I do have to uh, say that, of course, I, I'm not representing the pharmaceuticals here. So there might be some of you disappointed, but I, I can only deal with uh, what I know, and that is. Uh, uh, running uh, chemical plants. Um, on the first question, so do we need more uh, enforcement? I think um, the view of the chemical industry would be that uh, we, we agree more or less with the outpo outcome of the fitness check, 
that the legislative toolbox as such is already quite comprehensive and uh, we feel that uh, although there, there are some requirements that might perhaps be desirable but that the focus indeed should be on implementation and the role we see here for the commission and the common in implementation strategy in particular is really to serve as a platform where people can share experiences and best practices to move to move forward now, as we all saw in, in the various reports being presented here, the water uh, quality is influenced at, at, by many pressures. Uh, we have different types, point sources, diffuse sources, and we believe that most of the policy instruments are uh, available to deal with them. And what is key here, and will be the key challenge, I think, for the, for the next um, program of work for that common implementation strategy is really to think on consistency, how to keep the consistency and how to coordinate between those legislations. I think that's an important message, of course, from, from industry that uh, there needs to be a coordination and the consistency need to be kept. Uh, there was also some mentioning of monitoring made here and, and for us indeed this is key. Uh, good quality monitoring is, is really the first step. Um, it's, it's, it should not be an endpoint point it's say, but it really should be the starting point because once you have such a high quality data set, then the work starts in our opinion. I mean, you have to look at the data set and you have to see for those cases where you, all, where you have a, a significant risk being demonstrated, why is this risk there? Where is it coming from? What are the sources that contribute? And then I think what, what is needed is really an, um, I would say, a kind of deliberation room where you start to think what would be the most appropriate measures to take, uh, at what scale, and of course, the element of the cost-effective way of doing it would be very high on that um, agenda. So it needs to consider all possible sources, all possible inputs that makes that you don't meet the uh, quality objectives as you would like to. And on taking the measures, of course, for the chemical industry, for, for industry, uh, the ones we're mainly uh, involved in is a good implementation of the industrial emission directive. And on the other hand, of course, for the chemical industry, the implementation of REACH, which is the framework for the substances, for the chemical substance, is already today uh, largely contributing and achieving a good water quality. And uh, the as you know, as substances are only allowed uh, for, you, uh, for use if there is a demonstration of risk, of a controlled risk, sorry. Um, coming back to the question asked here, so in recent years, indeed, the water quality has been improved, and, and we can testify this as well. We see the fish back in, in rivers where we are discharging. And uh, we also, um, I think, did our chair, we had uh, our first of a kind uh, chemical sustainable, sustainability report, where you can see that indeed, for instance, take nitrogen, take phosphor, you can see that between 2001 and now we have the APR Terra data from 2010, we have heavily reduced our loads. So the, the, on nitrogen and phosphor, we went down with, uh, let's say, about 50, I think the numbers are 50, 40 percent for nitrogen and even 80 for phosphorus. And we also asked ourselves the question, how does that come now? Is this legislation? Is this enforcement? Or what is it? And I think at least what we think as, as chemical industry, it's a combination of many things. It is indeed a combination of legislation and it is also a combination of industry taking on board initiatives, voluntary initiatives as well, to have, uh, to have their operations running in a way respectful for the, for the environment. So um, from these numbers, so we're talking between 2001 and 2010, uh, if you know that the IED, so the, the documents, the, which are called BREF documents, so the best available technique reference documents, the first one for the chemical industry were there 2001, and the latest one was uh, finalized 2009. So you see, it's rather recent as the documents are there, and yet uh, we can already see some results uh, in the field. So. We believe that um, these, when it came, uh, the proposal from the blueprint, so to have ELV strengthening, I think um, what we would like to say there is to do a little bit of expectation management here. I think uh, the breath are focusing on the most significant environmental aspects, and it is indeed intended to control the emissions at the point where they leave the, uh, where they, where they enter the environment. Uh, it's not about regulating the operations, uh, the breaths are 
in that case not a place where you would find a, a level, a range of emissions for each and every one priority substance. You would find it, of course, for the most relevant ones. That, that goes without saying. But to have it for each and every, so to have a kind of range uh, that is, um, how shall I say, the range that, um, that you need to attain really to, to for, for when you're running your, your operations under BAT, to have that for each priority substance is, is not feasible and, and perhaps also not desirable and, and needed. You have to know that we are in the chemical industry, have eight, eight of these documents, all covering different products, all products have different processes beneath. So there's a huge variability beneath. So if you want to capture that all into one single bad conclusions, you probably are a bit disproportionate and, and asking a bit too much from the experts uh, participating to those events. Um, what can we say then that is the solution? So the fact of, of not having this range is by no way a, an escape route for, for the chemical industry because there are uh, parameters being defined at this moment, we are in the second revision of that particular breath, that allow to judge competent authorities whether or not these uh, wastewater treatments are operated under BAT. So uh, they, they, that, that's, that is an ongoing process. So. If, if you have that, and if then your envi the environmental monitoring of the member states show that there is an issue for a substance, uh, what we then say is then go back uh, to what I said at the start, try to find out what is, what is making that there is a, 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 apparently a significant problem, what are the sources. And yes, indeed, operation, industrial operation can be one of them. And then, of course, it is a matter of uh, experts of the industry sitting together with the experts of the competent authorities and try to come up with uh, the best way forward. And this is already ongoing. Sometimes processes are changed, etc. So I think the, the skills and the expertise of all local stakeholders here, including the competent authorities, are key. And that is, again, coming back to my first statement, uh, where we say that the Commission has this role to play of exchanging platform and sharing those experience. We are certainly willing to do, to do our uh, share, I would say, and um, today I'm also a Civicist, not me, but Civic is very proud to announce that we recently uh, did uh, launch the project, it's called Water Management, which is uh, really exactly there to promote uh, continuous improvement of water management at, at our member site with a focus on uh, water stressed areas and it's there to also spread good practice and report and we will uh, identify some indicators to show how we're doing and I hope to come back to you with a few years from here to show the results. Thank you Anne. Thank you. Niels, please. Thank you very much. Just a short overall remark on enforcement. Do we need more EU enforcement or more EU funds? I would say it's not a question which one we need more of. We need both enforcement and more funds to ensure the goals in, for example, the Water Framework Directive. This morning we had a discussion on ensuring full compliance with the Water Framework Directive in the area over abstraction of water. In this area, we need enforcement and not further rules. Let me explain with a parallel. If we have a speed limit and observe that 30% drive faster than the limit, some would say that we should reduce the speed limit. No, my opinion, first of all, the rules should be enforced. Thanks. So, thank you, Niels. Are you satisfied with that answer when I ask the Commission? <laughs> can, you, can you live with that statement? They said we need more money, we need more funds, more, more enforcement, uh, economic financial instruments, support, coordination. So this, this, is that the, the thing you want to hear from the panel? Well, I think at least it's very close to our own uh, analysis that is also coming out from the blueprint. So, I mean, what I presented is that we actually sh see a need for, for all of these things. We need 
we need more funds, but we need also conditionality when using funds. Uh, we need uh, to um, improve monitoring. We need to uh, enforce compliance. So, yes, I think that was a balanced reply. Okay, then we leave that question and go to the second one. Uh, an appropriate approach for adapting water infrastructure to expect extreme weather phenomena. And I would like to give the floor to Almut. Thank you, Chairman. Um, so, infrastructure is the next topic. And uh, when um, talking about the maintenance of infrastructure and having uh, appropriate infrastructures, I would like to split it in three sub um, topics. The first one is just maintenance of the existing infrastructure, which is a challenge as such. If you think, for instance, that in London we have Victorian pipe system, so uh, if you don't maintain that in a proper way, then you get to leakages rates uh, that are well known. To just choose one example, I could take another example, like for instance in Bulgaria, they are having very high maintenance uh, leakage rates that's uh, probably somehow linked to the fact that you didn't pay for water in the past and uh, the way how you could just have a tab running the whole time without fixing, uh, I mean leaking, without fixing it. Uh, there was no incentive to have that fixed, so you get, of course, a very high um, rates of water use and leakage, just to give some, some ideas of what, what that could mean. Then the, the second aspect is, or the, the next two aspects are both upcoming new aspects. In addition to just maintaining old aging infrastructure, there are new challenges. One, climate change is a challenge for water infrastructure. And two, the second one, the one we have already um, talked about, is uh, new um, pollutants. Uh, I mean, new, um, yeah, some of them are not that new anymore and well known. But uh, in the end, it always ends somehow with the water industry, especially with the waste services, like, take that out, please. <laughs> and of course, all this, be that adapting to climate change, that means uh, if you have uh, storm events, if you have heavy rain, if you have more extreme weather phenomena, um, your, your normal capacity to absorb um, rainwater is not sufficient. You have overflowing um, sewers and this creates uh, pollution which is uh, very severe, which is really uh, not to be uh, neglected. So you have to, to fight somehow with the aging infrastructure, you have to fight with new challenges by climate change and you have to fight with uh, new um, demands from yeah, political side, societal side, to take out all these new pollutants in the water. So who can pay for that? That's at the end always the questions. Uh, we know we cannot just come and ask the European Union to pay for it because there is no money available. <laughs> so what we suggest, because we are here to come up with ideas, one approach we su su suggest to, this, to tackle this problem is what we call the three T's approach. I don't know how many people in the room have heard from these three T's. T's. It's a concept we have presented already this year on the World Water Forum in Marseille. Uh, the three T's were developed by the OECD, among others. And uh, the, the three T's, that means tariffs, taxes, transfers. Um, as a matter of fact, very often you don't find appropriate solutions because you don't have, you are not aware of what is your um, latitude, how can you tackle a problem, and uh, because you just solve it in the historic way, that means if you um, improve your in, uh, infrastructure, then you have the consumer pay for it, you could just go up with the tariffs. That's what happens very often in some countries. In other countries you cannot do that uh, because there are fixed tariffs, so you need the money somewhere from the government and if the government doesn't give it you cannot act and so on. So you have all kinds of situations where you can be totally blocked and this 3Ts approach um, is an approach which starts with an analytical step to analyze where possible funding can come from. It's not only tariffs, you have a possibility to get funding from taxes or from transfers. Uh, taxes meaning, yeah, just all kind of taxes you can imagine. Uh, the state is collecting money that is then used for um, the infrastructure or transfer meaning all type of, type of, of money that can come from outside. For instance, uh, the one that was mentioned uh, by, uh, by uh, Gerke Ger 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 when you are investing in your infrastructure and you get some uh, uh, structural funds from the U European Commission, for instance, uh, from the European Union, for instance. That would be a typical case of such a transfer. Um, so the first thing would be really to, to analyze your situation and to see how it is in the, in the given situation, how your funding situation is, and then of course 
to, to find ways to improve this funding situation and to find ways to, to tackle uh, a given problem. And that's why it is extremely important that when um, financing infrastructural investment, uh, that you, you don't start with just a dogmatic approach like leakage has to go down and then you get a percentage and that applies for everyone, but that you approach by a case by case um, approach that you really look at a situation, a given situation, and you look what is most needed in that given situation, where to start with, what is, uh, where is the, the, the biggest um, um, waste, let's say, of, of, of whatever. Is that because your wastewater treatment plant is not uh, in the proper state, or is that because it's leakage or whatever, and really to take into consideration all the elements that are given in a place. Um, yeah, when it comes to... This is for the, for the general investment situation. If you are interested in this three T's approach, there is documentation available on that. You will um, find that on yeah, our website and on um, OECD, of course, too, who developed the, the thing. Um, when it comes to climate change, um, yeah, not only climate change, but in particular when it comes to the, this, uh, this phenomena, there is another important uh, element to tackle the problem, and this is the, the land use patterns, like um, uh, planning management of, of land use patterns and uh, Euro welcomes very much the basin approach and the sub-basin approach that is chosen by the European Euro, Euro Union. That helps a lot. Um, unfortunately, in the first uh, river basin management plans, the water utilities were not always involved uh, in a sufficient way. Uh, I guess this is a question of collective learning from both sides. Uh, I guess it was not only that they were not enough invited by the national governments, maybe they were invited but they were not, they, um, they couldn't react in an appropriate way. This is, again, has to be looked at in a case-by-case -case study. But all I can hear and observe from our members is that uh, in, in most of the places they would, have, they, they would have liked to be much more involved and they are now really working on uh, the second round to be better involved in that because uh, we believe that this is a very important um, uh, yeah, uh, instrument, policy instrument, and that uh, it's important that we have, uh, we can bring our expertise in these uh, processes. And now the, the third point, the new pollutants. Um, I will I will talk about that later because we are going to talk about that later. Just the first thing to say uh, already now is um, when we are talking about pollutants, uh, there is a reflex which is take it out in wastewater, that means, in, in wastewater treatment, that means end of pipe. And uh, Euro is really very strongly engaged to make um, all decision makers understand that this is really only uh, the last possible um, way to do it. We have absolutely to go upstream because it's just ways uh, too expensive to do it uh, at the end of the pipe. And, and it's not only a question of, of, uh, of money that you invest in it. This is feasible. Switzerland does it. And some, uh, I know it, there is a, a German Bundesland that is uh, having a wastewater treatment, which is really, very well de developed. But even even they say, even the, the, the places where uh, wastewater treatment is on a very high level, even they say it's not the right thing to tackle the problem of pollution, to take it out in of, of, um, of um, priority substances. It's not the right way to take it out in wastewater treatment. You have to to make sure it doesn't get in the water at all. And that's what we are right now in the, in the debate on the priority substances, what, what we are really fighting for. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think we will have an interesting discussion then. Uh, a brief response by Horg. Okay. Thank you very much. I think to this question we could have uh, two options. One, to uh, have more regulation. Um, for the new situation, like uh, we had before 1989, during the communist, it was for each industry a certain amount of water we, you can use. Now we practically we give up to this. We are back to the market economy and we are trying to put the right price. And everybody, if it's the right price, everybody can consume exactly what they could afford. And uh, the idea and the approach will be to promote uh, water conservation. And uh, this will bring also innovation in the water industry. And not only in the water industry in urban area, but also in the agriculture. Uh, because, you know, it's from a long period of time in some countries which 
has water shortage. There are uh, irrigation techniques which use very few water with uh, high productivity. Thank you. Thank you very much, George. Here the question two to the Commission. <laughs> Anything to add? What's the right direction or would you like to give advice to the audience for other questions? <laughs> Well, I think um, just coming back to the, the comment from, uh, from Euro, uh, we will have an, a whole session afterwards talking about um, economic instruments and prices and so on. So I think we will uh, save the discussion on the three Ts uh, for that, uh, but uh, just recalling that we have the cost recovery and incentive pricing requirements of the Water Framework Directive, uh, which certainly uh, goes in that direction. Uh, and then something that I didn't hear too much about that uh, um, George Constantine was just touching on now um, <coughs> is that I think what the question actually meant was more uh, how do we need to, what do we need to do in terms of, of water infrastructure. So we have a situation where we have a very risk adverse uh, European water industry, uh, maybe worldwide water industry. Uh, so how are we going to get away from using old uh, techniques? Uh, how are we going to be innovative in, in adapting and, and making sure that we have infrastructure that is actually fit for, for, the, new, uh, for the new challenges that we're going to face? Uh, so I think this still remains open, but we can leave that for the audience maybe to, to feed into. Thank you very much for that response. Uh, we come to the question three and four, the theme of reused waters. May I ask again, yeah. Almut, to okay. give the first introduction? Yeah, again, you will have to listen to me, but I will start this time with a picture. <coughs> so this, um, this young boy, um, not being so sure whether it's really a good idea to pee in your drinking water. <laughs> uh, I would like to start with this just to recall one, uh, one thing. Um, our um, water infrastructure was built in a way that we had one type of water for all purposes. Uh, that means is every, everything is drinking water quality for whatever use you have. And this is going to change. It's quite sure in a time of where water is scarce, you have what we call or we, are, we address sometimes by the word of cascading water qualities. Like for instance, to give an example, um, in our house we have rainwater harvesting, is a very old cistern built 100 years ago and we reactivated it and we are using that for our toilet flushing. <laughs> Just to give an example, I wouldn't, this is not the water quality I would drink. We had to make sure when building in this water cistern in our house that we, uh, we don't use it, uh, this water in a tap. There is one tap in the garden, we use it for uh, flower, uh, watering the, the garden and you have to put a little tag on this tap there to really put it's no drinking water quality so don't drink it. So this is what it is all about when we are talking about reuse and recycling of water. Uh, normally we speak about not the, the um, I mean rainwater harvesting is just one of the other alternative uh, water supplies that we have but when we are talking about reuse recycling we normally speak about reusing recycling water that comes out of the domestic houses means uh, what, yeah, um, what is collected in uh, wastewater treatment plants uh, and what is uh, after the, the tr treatment reused normally in agriculture and in industrial uses. Um, normally I say because of course there are many alternative ideas to, uh, to use grey water even in households and so on and so forth. So we have different types of water. Now um, what happens is that the potential of um, water reuse and water recycling is much more and not only in places like in Cyprus where it seems that 100% uh, of the water um, treated in, in wa uh, wastewater treatment plants is reused in irrigation as far as I am informed. Not, not yet but that's the aim that's what you are aiming at. <laughs> Um, but this, this is a uh, reuse of water, recycling of water should not only be uh, an option in, in countries where water stress is as obvious as in Cyprus. Um, I was told that even in Denmark this is an option because if you look um, at uh, the whole uh, cost and investment that you do in, in water, it can be very often a very good solution to do something less energy uh, uh, intensive. Um, but of course to get there you need
need uh, to have very clear standards because you don't want to run into health problems. Uh, and uh, if you and, and Euro is convinced that these standards they should not be established nationally uh, for each country individual and different standards. But it would be much much better to have them. Um, no, not much better. It would be absolutely necessary to have them established on European level and soon. Otherwise, national countries are going to act in due time. Um, the reason uh, why we need to have that done on European level is that we need uh, confidence. Like if you know that you, the salad you are buying was irrigated with reused water, you want to be sure that you still want to eat this salad. <laughs> uh, and we have a, a, an open market in Europe. Um, yeah, agricultural products can circulate. So that's why it's for the consumer for sure. It's much more reassuring if he knows that there are European standards that are implemented everywhere. If you're talking about health risks, what we have to keep in our mind is it's the same. We are talking about the same health risks that we have anyhow when talking about drinking water. Uh, the only difference is when you have water reuse, there is a higher um, yeah, probability of, uh, of um, uh, contact with, with all the, uh, the unwelcomed um, substances, be that viruses or be that bacterial or be that chemical uh, substances. Um, I think that's for my introduction, just to, to, to try to wrap up what it is all about, the water use and why it is important. Thank you very much. I think I just would like to <coughs> give the floor to Niels. I think from agricultural side, what do you think about reused water? Thank you very much, Stefan. Uh, first of all, a small remark. Uh, I've learned after several years that the Commission is already always right. So if you read the impact assessment, you can find in volume two several uh, uh, places where it's written that Cyprus use 100 uh, percent. The treated wastewater reuse rate was high in Cyprus 100 percent. So you have to learn in Cyprus that in fact you use it 100 percent. So that's very good. Uh, first, let me present some few remarks. The starting point for any discussion on water policy, and all regulation of agriculture for that matter, should be that meeting environmental demands can and must be in line with the goal of global food security, as well as achieving economic development both inside and outside the EU. We must remember that e Europe is in the middle of an economic crisis and we need all the jobs and growth we can muster. And agriculture employs of over 11 million people across Europe and is the building block of many other sectors. So we have to focus on achieving both economic growth and meeting the environmental challenges. In order to do so, sustainable intensification of agricultural production has to be achieved, as the FAO has stated. Concerning water reuse for irrigation and industrial purposes, water resources are becoming scarce, while pop population growth results in an increasing demand. We therefore need a high focus on resource efficiency and intensive water use in a sustainable way. In other words, produce more food with less water by a sustainable, intensive production. An effective way to achieve this goal is to reuse water whenever possible. Let me mention four specific points. First point, in order to reuse water for industrial and agricultural purposes, regulative barriers must be removed so rules do not hinder reuse. Second point, sustainable intensification of agricultural production and food production is not achieved overnight and we therefore need a focus on innovation and methods of production and an ongoing partnership 
with suppliers of technology and hardware. Third point, an analysis of what quality of water is needed to which processes in order to know where it is appropriate to use reused water and to what quality the water needs to be rinsed. And last, the fourth point, we should consider EU standards. Thanks. Thank you very much. Uh, I think the questions are answered. I don't give you the floor again, <laughs> but uh, I just <laughs> go I on. I, <laughs> I just go on to the pharmaceuticals and to the pesticides. And yeah, but we don't have time. Sorry. Um, I would like to, to to go to the question five and six. And because we are lacking of knowledge on pharmaceuticals, I ask the Commission to give a brief introduction on the state of the. Of, of the procedure of the pharmaceuticals, and would like to ask Peter to give us a short introduction to the question five. Thank you for this very grateful task. Um, this is, as everyone knows, I, I think uh, an emerging issue. And I think it's not surprising that it's an emerging issue, and it's not an issue that is going to go away. We're firstly speaking by the very nature of things, about biologically very potent compounds uh, that once we've used them, sometimes end up in our waters. Uh, and it's not surprising that they have effects. Uh, what we can expect, I think, is that with current demographic trends that the problem uh, that these substances may pose in the environment may increase rather than decrease. Uh, for two reasons. Firstly, people are getting older, and as is well known, older people consume more, uh, on the average, more pharmaceuticals than younger people. And secondly, uh, that w we also have redistribution across the territories of, of member states, concentration of, of population, which can contribute to this. Now, the, the current state of, of things is that uh, the Commission has made a proposal this year. I don't think we should discuss this proposal here. This is currently being discussed in uh, the Council of Ministers and in the European Parliament. But just to bring everybody up to speed, the Commission proposed in its uh, proposal for revision of the uh, so-called EQS Directive, Ecological Quality Standards Directive, the inclusion of three substances uh, under the directive. These are substances where concentrations were uh, above safe levels as uh, defined by uh, our scientific committee uh, and where the issue is widespread. These are, are problems that pose uh, problems of uh, or substances that pose problems of toxicity and problems of so-called endocrine disruption. Uh, basically, two of the substances pose a risk for uh, the reprodu reproduction of fish, uh, and which, of course, puts into question the biological uh, or the ecological targets of the Water Framework Directive. Now, let me say right away, it is our view that there is no silver bullet uh, to deal with these. There's no one single measure that, that can resolve uh, this kind of question, at least not in a cost-effective way and in an acceptable way. Uh, our view is that both the EU, the member states and industry must act uh, in order to, uh, for us to be able to resolve the issues. Uh, and they must act in a complementary way. Henriette mentioned that the Commission will come forward with a report and the Commission will look specifically at in the area of authorization of pharmaceutical substances, what can be done. I think Henriette described what the issues were. There are issues with veterinary pharmaceuticals where you can take account of environmental issues, but there's a question about to what extent this happens. And then the so-called human pharmaceuticals where the current legislative framework does not uh, allow this. The member states are in charge of health policy. They're also in charge of managing public costs. And in both of these, they act on pharmaceuticals in areas such as antibiotics uh, to reduce uh, resistance, uh, to um, a buildup of a resistance to antibiotics, to control costs of, of health policy, 
And the idea, our idea is that environment could enter into the basket of issues that could be considered at the level of member states in their policies. And finally, of course, industry is in charge of research and development in, in this area. And this is more the longer term perspective uh, is that once you have identified issues in the longer term, of course, the best solution is if you can replace problematic ph pharmaceuticals by less uh, problematic ones. And this requires an effort uh, from industry. So those, are, I think, are the three parameters. Those are the three things uh, that, that need to happen. And the Commission, of course, needs to consider uh, to continue developing standards for substances that are actually posing problems uh, in the environment, including uh, pharmaceuticals. Thank you very much, Peter. Uh, I would like to give the floor now to Niels and sort of change the subject to the pesticides. Would adding the directive on sustainable use of pesticides to cross compliance help reduce pesticide risks? Please, P Peter. Niels. Thanks again. First, a general comment on cross-compliance. We need fewer, simpler, and more targeted rules and solutions. And the rules should be respected by the states and be respected by farmers. We do not use, need additional rules. The aim of the CAP reform should be simplification. It is unacceptable to just keep adding new rules and regulations without looking at the entire picture. Each new rule means a new administrative burden on farmers, and we need to simplify regulations and reduce costs, not the opposite. When we look at pesticide risks, we need to get the proportions right. We need to target our effort to the areas where we have the greatest effect in terms of minimizing risk. First, we need to look at the approval system. This is where we decide which pesticides can be used at the European market. So this is where policymakers and regulators can make crucial decisions in terms of reducing risk. Secondly, we have point sources here, there is the risk of spillage and dilution of pesticides. By targeting regulation to point sources, we can also achieve a lot in the terms of reducing risks to the aquatic environment. Thirdly, it matters how pesticides are applied. The behavior of the farmer, or whoever is using pesticides, determine how great the risk to the aquatic environment is. Through education and proper use and maintenance of equipment, we can also achieve a lot. Thanks. So thank you very much. Uh, sorry, Georgi. I think I would like to open the floor now to the audience and bring you back probably to the question one, if possible, go through again, or we can start the other way around. Please state your name and institution again and ask your question or make a brief statement. Thank you. David Zetland of Wageningen University. I'm, a, I'm an economist, and economists are often accused of being accountants, but I'm going to break my, my statement, I suppose, uh, into a, a statement of accounting and a question of economics. The statement of accounting is that Niels uh, uh, told us that 11 million people in the EU are farmers, which leaves the other 98% of the EU population which is not farmers. So we do need to balance these costs and benefits of various regulations. My, account, my economic question is about property rights. And uh, people who are familiar with economics know that it's important to figure out who has the right to pollute or who has the right to be free of pollution. And I'd like to state this question and ask a, of a, a yes or no answer, let's say, from Anne and Nielsen and potentially the other panelists. Should uh, industrial or agricultural users of water have the right, or in a sense, uh, should they have the right to discharge dirty water? Uh, or is there a right, uh, do they have to uh, abide by discharging clean water? That is, should the regulations require that the water be as clean as taken in by either the farmers or industrialists when it is discharged? Or should the problem be left to the 
environment or to the water uh, uh, service providers. Thank you. In the same direction, a question? Um, yes. Klaas van Haan, uh, Conservation of Clean Air and Water in Europe. Um, I think that the legislation already in place gives clear standards to which water should be uh, comply to be regarded as sufficiently safe to be emitted into the surface water. So I think I already tried to answer the previous question. It's not the purpose of the industry. It's not the purpose of the industry to pollute the environment. We are um, citizens and we try to act responsibly as far as possible. And I think look at the track record of industry, we are delivering to the implementation of the IED and also other parts. In that respect, reading the blueprint, I think a very brave document has been published that enables achieving the goals of getting a better environment. However, I also see a missed opportunity. The pollution is directed to industry and there are many non-industrial sources for which environmental quality standards have not been derived. So in this respect, I do disagree with Euro that say, well, you have to do it upstream. Upstream it's done by a regulation called REACH. If the REACH regulations allows a substance on the market, it's evident that society wants that substance. If it then enters up in the environment, that's for the water cleaners to take it out. Because substances are not polluters. Polluters are the entities that introduce the substance into the aquatic environment. And if you want to make a profit by cleaning the water, you better deliver by taking it out. Thank you. Another statement or question in this direction? Yeah, in the back, please. Um, hello. Um, this is Andrew Farmer from the Institute for European Environmental Policy. I'd just like to comment on the issue of cross-compliance and the statement about adding rules. Um, I want to be very, very clear that the requirements of cross-compliance, whether it's on pesticides, nitrates, habitats directive, animal welfare, whatever, are not additional rules on farmers. They are existing rules that farmers have to comply with. The only additional requirement may be in terms of administrative, administratively demonstrating compliance. But the, the requirements arising for environmental protection are not additional rules. It's simply saying that taxpayers' money given to those farmers should be conditional on meeting the legal obligations which are already in place. All right? So they're not additional rules in that sense. So thank you. I would like to give the floor to Anne and Niels and then to the water director sort of to give his view. Okay, thank you. Thank you for the question. Um, being not an economist but an engineer, of course, my first reflex is always to discuss uh, what do we understand by dirty water or um, by, by environmental water and discharging. And, and the reply has already been given to a large extent, I think. Are we allowed to discharge dirty water? Well, not in my opinion, because of course our discharge permits, um, somehow it is the task of the competent authorities to relate that with the quality objective that they have to meet for the uh, overall water framework directive. So, and then it is a matter, and I agree there with Klaas, then it's not only looking, of course, at, at uh, industry as uh, point discharger, but take, that is what, what, and that was what my plea was here, to take an overview. I really think that uh, this coordination and coherence between legislation is, is, is of extreme importance. We were discussing upstream and again Klaas gave the reply but I was just about to make the same comment. REACH also has an environmental component to look at so it starts with registration. With registration you as a producer, I mean I as a producer, we have of course to take into account the environmental exposure including the water. So then we are, of course, in our risk assessment and our, our more extended reports, and then that finds its way to what is called safety data sheets so that the users know exactly how to use that substance. So I really want to make a plea here. It's not because a substance is hazardous that they immediately would find its way in a hazardous, as, a, as an ultimate hazard to the surface water. That's not the case because there are operational conditions installed and risk management measures. Then, of course, if these are all complied with and if they indeed at the start were the right ones,
There is a readjustment to do on the, uh, on the road. We all are learning, I would say. But then you would not find, of course, uh, a significant risk in the water, an unacceptable risk in the water. So, so that is for me the, the upstream. So if there are still substances there, um, if they are compliant, let's say, with what the, uh, the original producer of them had imagined in their, uh, in, in their first step into the authorization process, also in the reach, in the evaluation process, then in principle this risk should be acceptable. If not, of course, then we need to get the coordination between the legislations working. That coordination should be, and that uh, we very much underline, should be a coordination looking at all possible measures targeting all possible uh, and so, yes, discharging, yes, discharging, but never discharging uh, in such a way that at the end of the day, the uh, quality standard could not be met by the, by the member states. And are we paying? Yes, we are paying. So there are different systems, as you probably are more aware of uh, being an econ economist, but industry is, of course, paying to, to get water in the first place, discharge taxes are also at work. So, so yes, I think... Um, and that's where I would like to end. So thank you, Niels, please. Thank you. Uh, first of all, I think uh, it's not 100% the same to have an industrial production and an agricultural production, because the agricultural production is in the free nature. And it is impossible to have an agricultural production which do not influence on the environment. If you go and plow the soil, you will influence the environment. So it's very different to the industry where you only have a chimney and, and the wastewater. Um, and if we reduce the production in EU to lower the emissions, there will be an increase in other parts of the world, areas where the environmental pressure is much higher. So in fact, we just export the problems and globally increase the environmental pressure. When this is said, I don't say that we shouldn't take care of the environment. We should do anything we can to reduce the pollution or the uh, pollution from the agricultural production. Concerning the, no the other question uh, on cross-compliance, I must agree that uh, it's not adding new rules. But I just want to give an example why I'm very disfavor of the cross-compliance. We have two farms. We have one farm, 10 hectare, with full irrigation. It have an over-abstraction of water with 50%. We have another farm, 500 hectares. It irrigates 5 hectare and it has an over-abstraction of 5%. So the penalty with the cross-compliance would be for the small farm, which really had an over-abstraction of 50%, it would have a penalty of 100 euro. While the big farm, large farm, with only 5 hectares and only a very, very small over-abstraction, would have a penalty of 5,000 Euro. After my opinion, it is not a fair solution. Let's take another example. If you are employed in the Ministry of Justice or Transport, and you're paid by the government, if you get a parking fee or speed ticket, should you then have a 10% cut in your income? I wouldn't say that would be reasonable. You should have the same cut as everybody else. Thanks. Okay. Hey, Olga, what do you think? Yeah, thank you. Uh, um, related to the um, water pollution, you know, there are, as it was said, there are standards in which water could, the used water could be discharged. Uh, what is new with these uh, environmental quality standards, it's the approach that you have to look on the river. And even if you have a standard, you have to go back. If you have 100, uh, one river, 100, uh, let's say, wastewater treatment plants discharging at the standard, will be a disaster. If you have one, will be nothing. 
Yes, this is the approach with these environmental quality standards, which you'll have to look in the river. In fact, the Water Framework Directive changed the philosophy. Till the Water Framework Directive, it was this targeted the point sources like wastewater treatment plant, and it was not looking on the river. Now, the Water Framework Directive is looking on the river, but also keeping the uh, wastewater treatment plant. Then, this will be probably um, the idea of have uh, trade of permits will be an issue. It's already applied. Uh, it was already applied in the United States, but it was the case of a lake. The case of will be a little bit more complicated. Then, related to the to the agriculture, I wanted to say that with agriculture, the most important thing it's the awareness and training of the farmers. It's easy to check on the point sources, but it's impossible to check how the farmer is spreading the pesticides. It's very much depending on he, because you cannot stay near each farmer to see if it's uh, washing the uh, tank uh, somewhere, or it's very, very important. And then you just see on the, uh, in the groundwater level of these substances. Uh, related to the explanation that uh, they have already this obligation, yes, but as we have seen in the blueprint, the Commission is proposing to extend these uh, vulnerable uh, zones to, in order to um, have a greater impact on the improving of water quality. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Any further questions from the audience? Yes, please. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Gunnar Norén from the Coalition Clean Baltic. I just have a comment on the um, uh, Commission presented then as one of the blueprint proposal extending of nitrogen vulnerable zones according to the nitrate directive. That's one proposal. And I think it's very good, of course, and that should be then the minimum standard. We have in the region where I come from, the Baltic Sea region, for example, one country, Poland, have 1.5% of the whole Poland is then not into all of a zone, but they have 40% of all agricultural land in the Baltic Sea catchment in Poland. So that makes sense. But I would also like to say that uh, actually, we just fulfilling Extending then the nitrate volume zone, you will not solve all the problems with the nitrate and with the groundwater and with the eutrophication. And the reason is then, of course, that um, um, the, uh, it's, it's when you spread the manure what time of the year, if it's during the growing season or not. If not, it will leak. If you spread it during winter time, it will leak. But it's also then more related to the, the, the nitrogen nutrient surplus you have per hectare. It's the nutrient surplus that is the driver then to leak then to the groundwater or leaking then to the surface water. So if we really shall deal with this, we have to discuss then what drives this. And that's my question then to Nils Peter Nuring here. I would like to ask you then, you're saying here we're talking about agricultural production and exporting then our problem to other regions in the world if we if we uh, have uh, stronger requirements here. But would agriculture sector also will be willing then to try to solve the Baltic eutrophication problem and run then practices and nutrient fertilization, nutrient balance fertilization in a way that we can cope with this? That's my question. Thank you. A similar question? Um, slightly different. My name is Lesha Whitmer, in this case with my head on from Women for Water Partnership. I would like to make three comments. I think in your first question there's one very important element missing. You say enforcement and funds, and I would say participation and information. Because they can help largely with uh, battling against water pollution, maybe not in all cases of the chemicals and the pharmaceuticals, but a lot of other pollutions, I would suggest, can be tackled by the average citizen and even smaller companies in Europe. Um, the second one is um, about pharmaceuticals. This is something that uh, a lot of women in Europe have been asking attention for and battling for for years now. So, number one, we're very, very happy it is finally in the blueprint. 
we're not so happy that then the next um, uh, well, there's not much we can do about it. So we would suggest that one of the, the good ideas is to really bring the conversation up to speed with the pharmaceutical industry, but also with our um, experts on uh, sanitation and toilets. Because a lot of this stuff just goes through the toilet from our households, from our hospitals, from our nursing homes. So maybe there's technology there that can help us. The pharmaceutical industry says they have solutions, but nobody has been willing to pay for them yet. So maybe that's where the conversation should start. Um, and there was also a conversation on uh, the green infrastructure. And there are some experiments going on in the world on really asking an eco-service from our wetlands, for instance, in addressing the, the problems of getting the pharmaceuticals out of our waters again. Um, and last but not least, I think that um, one of the interesting things of REACH is that it actually has another goal, that is to give information on the public on what chemicals are doing. Maybe we can add to that and make clear what the chemicals are doing to our waters or not. Because in some cases, you might be right, they could not be harmful, but then people do not know and have demands on information um, simply because they do not understand. Vice versa, they might be very, very bad for all of us. And information might help to reduce the use of the chemicals. Thank you. Thank you. And there was a third one in the back. Yes, please. Hello. Uh, my name is Savas Mouzakis. I'm from Cyprus. And I represent I form EU, the organic sector. I want to make a small statement. Uh, I form a EU group welcome blueprint communication is an important step to assess achievements and needs for further action in EU water policy. It is committed to contribute to further policy development to ensure sustainable management of water resources. We believe that organic farming is the best practice to protect water sources and has positive impacts on water management through prohibition of uh, synthetic pesticides, reduces costs for drink water suppliers to eliminate contaminants stemming from agriculture, reduced nutrient leaching through crop rotation, lower livestock densities, and increased water retention potential in soils through improved uh, soil structure. Um, and regarding the Water Framework uh, Directive, types of measures including input reduction limiting fertilizers, organic farming practices, soil erosion land cover, uh, water saving measures, irrigation efficiency, and land use change by trips, uh, which reduce runoff and enhance biodiversity should be part of RBMP. Thank you. So thank you. Uh, I would like to give the floor to Niels to answer the question about the nitrate uh, surplus. Thank you very much. We will, of course, like to go into a discussion with the European Commission and with the national governments to fulfill the Water Framework Directive. We will like to, together with member states, environmental NGOs and others, in a constructive way, try to find the best solutions. So we can get good water quantity and quality, get better nature, and reduce greenhouse gases, and at the same time, increase production, because there's an increase in demand for agricultural products, for food, and for uh, energy, and other things in the future. So we will really like to go into a constructive debate to find the best solutions. How can we achieve the good agricultural or the good uh, environmental uh, standard? Thanks. Thank you. And George, please, for the pharmaceuticals. Okay. Yeah, not only, but uh, about GWP. You said that participation and information is not in the question, probably because it's already in the directive. And we had uh, every member state to present to the Commission how this has been uh, 
uh, carried out during the development of the river basin management plan. Here it's also uh, an issue which we had the discussion with NGOs in our country. Participation from the perspective of authority is too much. We could provide consultation, but participation depends on the people to participate. And here I can see the role of NGOs. If the participation is low, I said to, to our friends in Romania, it's also a failure of the NGOs. Related to pharmaceuticals, I think that the solution are. In 1998, I seen in Japan a wastewater treatment plant, 500 million US dollars, with uh, ozone, uh, ozonization, with uh, membrane and uh, ion exchange residues. Nothing will, the, the water in that wastewater treatment plant was more clean up than I've ever seen. But it was just for demonstration. You know, the, 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 the Japanese like to impress the people because when I ask 500 million US dollars, okay, this is very expensive. Um, this with the green infrastructure, it's already uh, covered uh, and it was uh, uh, included in our, at least now Romanian, river basin management plan, both from uh, the flood uh, management point of view, but flood management with the Water Framework Directive. And also, I agree that uh, this information uh, to the public should be uh, intensive, particularly to the uh, uh, substances. But on the other hand, you know, um, especially related to pharmaceuticals, this is very tricky issues. You know, uh, you have diclofenac. I took diclofenac. It's when you have pains, you have... Uh, you need to take it, and you probably, if the industry has this toilet, which is also wastewater treatment plant, this will be good <laughs> to have, because the problem is, when it's an industry, you can go there and say, from tomorrow you will not discharge. Okay, this is from the European Commission order, and you will not discharge these substances, and otherwise we will stop. But this will be very difficult to tackle when you speak about population, and everything will go in, uh, uh, to, to the suit. Of course, the idea will be, as I said, to have a technology which will be affordable. The technology exists, but I cannot say that this will be affordable in this moment. However, this is at the, not at the beginning. Uh, this uh, endocrine disruptors is a discussion from a long period of time. Even human naturally are producing these endocrine substances. But the idea will be how this will manage, and in this respect, probably the innovation and uh, innovation in this field and the um, funds for promoting the innovation will be very important. Thank you. Thank you very much, Georg. I have to excuse the commission. I have to leave the neutral position and make a statement. <laughs> the, the costs of a fourth step in, in a wastewater treatment plant is about two coffees per month and not 500 million for one wastewater treatment plant. It's about two cups of coffee a month which would increase the wastewater treatment price uh, in Switzerland. That's just, I go back to the, to the neutral position. I just closed and, and start again. Um, <laughs> I think we have the last round. Is, is there any urgent question out there? If not, then I would like to give the floor to Anne for a last statement and then to Almut and then I will wrap up the session. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, last statement, I think all in all, uh, the way we currently look at what the Commission has been proposing in the blueprint does make a lot of sense and is, in uh, our opinion, really a, a good step forward. There's still a lot of work to do, that's obvious, from all, from all sides, also from us. Uh, but I think the analysis presented is, is, is really an uh, excellent uh, basis to start working on. Um, my last statement was indeed like what I said, that there is really a need um, to do some I would say better, as, as Mr. Potocznik mentioned, so to, to have the implementation done in a better way. Uh, to do it, I would say, in a sensible way also, uh, not pinpoint to some uh, particular industries, but look at this as a common um,
task ahead of us, uh, trying to find the best solution for all parties, the most um, appropriate for environment, the most appropriate for uh, uh, industry as stakeholder. Um, I would also want to say don't underestimate what REACH is already delivering just by the simple fact of starting to register. That's already huge. Um, also on the reuse, uh, we didn't have time, but I want to say reuse is fine. And whenever we can save water, I think we should do it. But I think we should not lose out of sight that reuse in say can never be an objective. I mean, coming from a manufacturing process, I mean, uh, looking, looking at that scope, it cannot be an objective in say. Uh, we always need to carefully consider by reusing water, how much energy are we putting in? How much new materials are we putting in? So it all, it's always about a careful balance. Um, I couldn't develop it further, but I think that's the point I, I wanted also to make there. And um, with that, I, um, on the participation from LECA, I very much agree to that. I think also industry should participate more and get to know who are the other users of the water basin or of smaller unit where I am, because of course that determines the risks of the operation. So we would also very much, of course, be in favor of having such um, stakeholders or local structures. And um, with that, I would like to leave it and uh, leave the rest for coffee break. So thank you. Then Almut, please. <clears throat> thank you, Stefan. Um, yes, I feel um, like answering to the two cups of coffees before you get one cup of coffee. I think that should make it for the fourth session. <laughs> um, yeah, if we are saying it's uh, uh, not the right place to do it, end of paper. We are not only addressing financial um, costs, and uh, you have to be aware that the two cup of coffees they add up to all the other cup of coffees it costs to fix the leakage and uh, uh, invest in um, getting less uh, vulnerable to climate change and so on and so forth and then it's a bit more than only two cups of coffees <laughs> um, but for, but to come back to, to my, my statement is really to have a look um, at the whole system uh, like how we treat our water and that uh, euro expresses really a, a heavy concern um, about this as I called it that reflects just to ask like the, the guys at the end of the pipe, please take everything off that all the others put in it, <laughs> just without really thinking whether they wouldn't be a mean not to, um, to make sure it doesn't get in the water. Um, of course, we are addressing the polluter pays principle. And uh, thank you, Peter, for the, your introduction to this point, uh, really making clear it's not as easy as that. We are not talking about the pharmaceutical industry in the, in the place where they produce, like for instance, endocrine disruptors, better known as the pill. Um, uh, that this is not the place where it goes into the water circle, it goes in a, in a way in the water circle which is very difficult to control and we are very aware of that. And class, to come back to your intervention, uh, it's not uh, about saying we want to ban the pill and uh, feminism is over and all that, as it was translated by uh, MEP uh, Rod Berndt. Um, it, is, it is about responsibility. What we want is really talking about responsibility. We have some experience in the, in the field of pesticides, which is, um, on one hand, of course, you, you always first need legislation, otherwise nothing will happen. But then you have, uh, it's, it's about behavior, and you need sometimes just to sit on a round, round table and uh, to develop best practices and to really make sure that everyone is contributing, contributing for, for, from its side. And it, uh, in, in, the, in, the, in the field of pesticides, uh, there is more to be done. Of course, we are in favor of cross-compliance. Um, um, but but uh, in the field of pharmaceuticals, we believe that uh, there is a lot of things that can be done that have not yet been done in terms of preventing these substances to, to get into the water cycle. And uh, we think it's an, it's an important role that we, we play uh, to, to, to point a finger at that and to ask really to reinforce uh, the, the, the several measures that are available to, to better source control. And uh, legislation is one and uh, behaving uh, uh, awareness raising is another and uh, doctors have a role to play, consumers, I mean the the, the people who are taking diclofenac, uh, everyone has a part of the responsibility in it and the pharmaceutical sector has a big, big responsibility uh, in all this and uh, these people have to take their share of this responsibility, uh, be that by paying or be that by um, at least reflecting their own behaviour, maybe eventually change their behaviour and the choice uh, and make another choice to take less of it or another product as soon as it's available. <coughs> Thank you. And the last statement from the Commission, Henriette, please. 
Thank you very much. I just wanted to very briefly mention uh, two uh, parallel initiatives uh, to the blueprint, I would say, that uh, maybe could uh, help us take some of these issues forward. Um, we've heard a lot about uh, how uh, complying with the law and, um, and uh, especially the Water Framework Directive in cross compliance, etc., will uh, take all the farmers out of, uh, of works and, uh, and that uh, we will not have enough food. But I think we also need to look at this from the other side, uh, from the other side of the coin because I think we have all failed a little bit to argue how improved environmental protection, uh, implementation of the EU legislation, green infrastructure, etc., will actually benefit jobs and growth. Uh, and that's something that we are taking forward uh, under the uh, European semester exercise. We're trying to, to show that actually doing all these things uh, have very positive effects uh, for, for jobs and growth. Uh, then uh, we talked about uh, water reuse and I just wanted to mention that under the um, European Innova Innovation Partnership for Water that the Commissioner uh, referred to this morning, this is one of the priorities that has been selected and we are going to call uh, for demonstration, uh, um, demonstrations on how we can actually uh, implement this fit for purpose uh, water uh, at the European level. So all of the people who are here who have uh, good ideas and, and, uh, and think this is the way forward, uh, I invite you to follow that process as well. And thank you very much for the contributions. Thank you very much. I was... Uh, okay, he, he gets <laughs> the floor again. <laughs> very brief, I would like to suggest that we follow the FAO recommendation sustainable intensification of agricultural production. And as mentioned earlier, let us gather agriculture, environmental NGOs and authorities to discuss the environmental status, the environmental goals, to understand and agree on the challenges, and together find the best solutions. Solutions not only in relation to water and agriculture, but also solutions in relation to nature and greenhouse gases. Thanks. And you too? No, okay. <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, all the panelists. I, the, the first question, uh, we, we talked about money, innovations, enforcement, participation and involvement, so that, that kind of stuff. And I asked the Commission, are you satisfied with that discussion? I think we can leave that. Then the second one, we actually didn't discuss uh, in the sense you thought in the presentation, uh, sorry for that. Then three and four, the, the reused, I think there was sort of a consensus that, that the legislation has to be done on, on European level. We have to be careful on that, the, the reused water and so forth. I think that that's on a, on a good way. And in the last two points, the five and the six, I think I didn't succeed with sort of coming forward with these topics. We have the different positions. Uh, don't do it in the wastewater treatment plant, just look at the, at the source. The human being is also a source of hormones, Almut. So I think that the source control of a human being of hormones is extremely difficult, I, I can tell you. So, and when you, and, 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 and when you, not only when you fell in love, so no, and, no, and if you look at the end of pipe solution, you don't just focus on pharmaceuticals and, and, and endocrine disruptors. You have how, ma how many million chemicals produce you in your, in your uh, uh, I think 100,000 or even more, and most of them end up somehow in, in, in the water. And you can do whatever you want, you will find them. And the end of pipe uh, solution is one of them which can reduce uh, this amount of chemicals into the water. So I think there, unfortunately to the Commission, we have sort of a different positions. I think you have to work further on that. With that, I would like to close the session. You have only time for one coffee. <laughs> you can only buy one of the wastewater treatment plants <laughs> with that coffee and not two of them. And I would like uh, you a further interesting conference here in Zypern. Thank you very much. <laughs>